Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on the key, just like a, uh, a key that goes into the lock of a door. But more specifically, for example, the key of David. And like I've mentioned, I'm uploading all my current videos to Bright, I'm sorry, BitChute. Brighteon is worthless. They don't even have my stuff show up hardly anymore. So I'm on BitChute, B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E. And uh, when I'm no longer on YouTube, you can find me. I'm a silver supporter of BitChute, which means I give them 10 bucks a month. You know, it's worth it. All right, go to the book of Isaiah. And we're going to read from chapter 22. Now there's... The reason I have a picture of my Bible with two keys on it in the thumbnails is the one key to truly understanding the Bible is that you understand who Israel is. And if, you, if you're like Stephen Anderson, you know, you think, well, everybody's Israel. Everybody. Um... You know, at least that's what I heard him say in a message in the past. He says, oh, well, you know, we're all so mixed up. We're all Israel. I don't think so. Personally, I believe those that accept true Christianity, those that built the churches, those that printed the Bibles, specifically America and Europe, I believe that they are divorced Israel from Jeremiah 3.8. And then the Lord promised in Jeremiah 31, 31, that he would make a new covenant with Judah and Israel. And however, the second key is in, I believe it's in Ezra chapter 9, it talks about Israel having the holy seed mixed with the other seed. Now, if there's a holy seed, there has to be an unholy seed. So, what can I tell you? In the book of John, chapter 10, uh, let's see, around verse 29, 28, 29, Jesus said, As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So, that's one of the keys to understanding the Bible. And then, let's take a look at Ezra 9. All right, Ezra 9, chapter 1. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves. Oh, that's racist have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to the abominations even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken uh, of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands, 
Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. Forgive me, I had to get some water there. Now, when you read the rest, you know, and when I heard this thing, I rent my garment, my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. Guy pulled his hair out. Okay? So, if there is a holy seed, there has to be an unholy seed. Now, if you're interested in knowing the origins of the Canaanites, they were human satanic angel hybrids from, well, Genesis 6 records it, but also after. I have a playlist on that if you're interested, about 10 or 12 hours of study from the guy that founded the, um, I think it's Colorado Christian College or Denver Christian College. He wrote the book back in the 30s. I make some comments with it too, add some new material. Well, not new material. The Bible's, I don't know, 1900 years old, <laughs> so it's not new. But uh, there's a holy seed and there's an unholy seed. And those, knowing who the holy seed is, Israel, and who the unholy seed is, when you know those two keys, the Bible is, well, with the Holy Spirit, the Bible's a, an open book. But that's why I have the two keys on my Bible, on the picture. So, with that being said, let's go to Isaiah chapter 22. Wow, I can't believe it. It's almost seven minutes, and I'm just starting the Bible study. What an introduction. Verse 1. The burden of the valley of vision. What aileth thee now, that thou art wholly gone up to the housetops? Thou that are full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Thy slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. I'm not exactly sure. I, I think this is kind of alluding to they're spiritually dead uh, that's kind of how I look at it um, Isaiah is a pretty tough book in some ways verse 3 all thy rulers are fled together they are bound by the archers all that are found in thee are bound together which have fled from far therefore said I look away from me I will weep bitterly Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. For it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexing by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. Now, I believe this is alluding to the Babylonian captivity when the king of Babylon came in and took Jerusalem if memory serves me correctly, a third of the people were killed in the battle, and then a third were taken into slavery into Babylon, and then the poorest third were left in the land to till the soil and what have you, so that you know uh, you want to leave your farmers in the you know area so that they can tend the crops, and then you can. Uh, have the farmers send you their, you know, uh, the king's portion of food to Babylon every year. So, verse 6. And Elam bare the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen, and Kir uncovered the shield. And it shall come to pass that thy choicest valley shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah. And thou didst look in that day to the armor, to the house of the forest. Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David. Now, Jerusalem's called the city of David. That they are many. And ye gathered together the waters of the lower pool. And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem. And the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. 
see that when the in this during the siege the wall was being broken down so they were dismantling people's houses to to take the stones from the houses to put it on the wall to try to build it back up but uh babylon at the time was considered the greatest world first world empire there ever was and um uh, you know, Jerusalem was, well, when she had the protection of the Lord, there was nobody could touch her. Matter of fact, the king of Assyria, prior, years prior, had uh, taken northern Israel captive and came and besieged Jerusalem and an angel of the Lord came and smote the Assyrian army dead. I think, if memory serves me correctly, it was like 190,000 men. That's a huge army. And they were all dead. Let's see if I can find that. Okay, here we go. I found it. Second Kings 1935. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred fourscore and five thousand and when they arose early in the morning behold they were all dead corpses i was wrong it's not a hundred and ninety thousand it was a hundred eighty five thousand i was off by five thousand forgive me a uh, parallel verse is isaiah thirty seven thirty six then the angel of the lord went forth and smote in the camp of the assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand and when they arose early in the morning behold they were all dead corpses so the lord allowed the assyrians to take northern israel captive however they he did not allow the assyrians to take jerusalem all right let's go back to isaiah 22 uh Verse 10, I guess. And ye number the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. Ye made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but ye have not looked unto the maker thereof. Ah, yes. They were looking to the work of their own hands, but they weren't looking to the Lord God of heaven and earth that had blessed them. Neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. And in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. Why to baldness? Because people would shave their head in shame. Verse 13. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine, Listen to this. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Have you ever have you ever heard that saying before? Eat, drink, and be merry. Um, and the Sodomites call it um, eat, drink, and or or the trannies. You know, be merry, M A R Y. Yeah. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord God of hosts. Take this to heart, America and Europe. If you're God's people, and I think you are, nothing's changed in God's eyes. We've changed. You know, I remember when I was a small kid, uh, women would put a scarf, a head covering on. And nobody wore thong bathing suits or bikinis or whatever you want to call them. Uh, people were modest back in them days. I mean, I was real young, but I remember. Because I used to travel all over the place and mom and dad never really worried about me and they weren't bad parents it was just things were safe um in the early 
nine I think it was like nineteen sixty or nineteen sixty one, there was less murders in the entire United States than what was in Chicago alone last year. So what does that tell you? And Chicago's not even the largest city in the United States. It's third. New York and LA are number one and two. I don't I'm not sure. I think New York's number one. I think LA's number two. But Chicago's number three. And um, about a hundred something years ago, Chicago was the largest city in the United States, but that was, you know, a hundred and something years ago. However, in 1960 or so, FBI statistics, there was less murders in the entire United States than what was in Chicago last year. What changed? America changed. All right, so let's keep going. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasure, even unto Shibna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewn thee out a sepulchre here, as he that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth an inhabitation for himself in a rock? Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee see they uh the book of daniel daniel was one of the princes of judah and he went into captivity and you've heard of the, the three hebrew children that were in the fire shadrach meshach and abednego yeah verse 18 he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt, there shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I believe those were Levite priests, I'm not sure. And I will clothe him with my robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Huh, maybe I'm wrong. I wonder if those are Christ's descendants via the flesh from Judah. I'm not sure. Well, maybe that'll be another study. All right, verse 22. Here's the punchline. And the key of the house of David, the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Now remember something. David was given an unconditional kingship. And we're going to cover that. And Christ, via the flesh, is from Judah. Now, I have a playlist on King David, a type of Christ, where I contrast King David's life and Christ's life and his ministry. And I don't remember how long it is, how big it is, but it's it's a couple things. I cover where Christ is uh, king and high priest and a few other things. Uh, think about it. Mary, who bare Christ, she was not of the tribe of Judah. She was a Levite. Levites were the priest tribe. They were the ones that carried the tabernacle. Mary carried the tabernacle of God in her belly, in her womb. Think about that. So, 
And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Verse 23. Are they, is this a reference to the crucifixion? Let's take a look. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is, but I, it's what popped into my mind. All right. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. All right. Shoulder. Very important. We're going to cover that. So that he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail. That's why I said, is this reference to the crucifixion? And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang. Didn't he hang upon the cross? And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity from the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord hath spoken it. All right, let's read Revelation chapter 3. Uh, I guess we'll go read the whole thing. Verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. So I guess physically they are alive, but spiritually they're dead. Verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Now here it is. Jesus is telling a believing church to repent. There are some very famous TV, uh, YouTube personalities, preachers, that say that uh, to repent means to turn from your unbelief, not your wicked works. So, does this mean that the church has to repent of their unbelief? A believing church has to repent of their unbelief? No. No. They're unfruitful works. That's what he wants us to repent from, if you believe. Oh, there's so much heresy on the uh, internet, and I don't claim to have all the answers and know it all. I mean, you know, even Jesus didn't know what day he was coming back. And if there's things that Jesus didn't know, you better believe there's things that I don't know. So, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore... Thou shalt not watch. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And I guess their garments is their flesh. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, clothing, and I will not, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. You know, people, next time you hear somebody talk about eternal security and once saved, always saved, think about having your name blotted out of the book of life. I'm not going to tell you they're wrong, but I'll tell you what, there's... If your name could be blotted out of the book of life, that eternal security and once saved, always saved, may not hold water. It may not be true. 
He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And, you know, we better not, if if we confess Jesus before men, he'll confess us before his, his Father and his angels. But if we deny him before men, Christ will deny us before the Father and his angels. And Christ also said that we had to endure, endureth unto the end. Verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now here's the punchline. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now phileo is a Greek word that means love. And you probably have heard agape too. Everybody tells me they're different meanings, but, you know, to me, I don't know. I was doing a study on it, and it seems like they're used pretty much interchangeably. There might be nuances to the depth of the love. I don't know. But there are different kinds of love. Everybody who's familiar with romantic love that's between a husband and a wife, uh, the love between a child and a parent, or a parent and a child, uh, love between sisters, love between brothers. Uh, King David loved Saul's son, Jonathan. And um, the Bible even declares that he had love for him. And, and the sick so-called Bible scholars will say that, well, you know, they were, they were sodomites in love with each other. Uh, tell you what, God has a place for people like that, and uh, they better buy some asbestos underwear for where they're going. They're not going to need winter coats, I assure you. So, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy. Now who's holy? Only Christ. Only God is holy. Saith he that is holy. He that is true. He that hath the key of David. He that hath the key of David. He that openeth. And no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man uh, openeth. You know what? When you knock on the door to the shepherd, and he opens the door, the door is open. And when he shuts that door, it's shut. I mean, I know that seems, you know. But the thing is, he's the one with the key. He's the one that opens the door. I don't have the key. You don't have the key. In John chapter 10, verse 7, we read, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Okay, back to Revelation 3 and verse 7. And to the church of the uh, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things saith he that is holy he that is true he that hath the key of David he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth verse eight I know thy works behold I set before thee an open door and no man can shut it for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. What is that name? Jesus. 
<laughs> you know, when you read in Luke chapter 1, it was Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, that told, oh, I forget if he told, I think he told Mary, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Let's take a look. Yeah, it was Mary. Okay, Luke 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Oh boy. I think I'd be, you know, if I was a woman and some, somebody came in saying this stuff, I'd be like, whoa, what's up? All right, so, verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, oh yeah, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Yeah, what kind of greeting is this? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua HaMashiach. No, no. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. The New Testament was written in Greek. And when they tell you, oh, well, Yeshua is a Hebrew name and it means salvation. Well, so does Jesus in the Greek. And shalt call his name Jesus. The angel Gabriel called him Jesus. Who are these devils that dare to change his name? Who are these people? Verse, and thou shalt call his, and shalt call his name Jesus. Verse 32, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So who are these people that dare to change his name? Revelation 3 and verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Are all these Yeshua people denying his name? Verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Who's this Yeshua crowd? I think verse 9 tells you who they are. The synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. But that's my opinion. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Um, Christ says he's coming quickly. Um, it's been almost, what, around 2,000 years? But in, I think it's Second Peter, it's in the book of Peter. I, I don't remember if it's First or Second Peter, but it says, uh, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. So, you know, when the Lord says he's coming quickly, you know, a day or two is pretty quick. 
to the Lord. To us, it seems like an eternity. And of course, the skeptics will say, well, 2,000 years. Yeah, that's not pretty quick. Well, you got to look at it from the Lord's point of view, not ours. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Good advice. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, which cometh down from out from, uh, of heaven for my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the church, uh, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Now, you know, for what I've read in history, the church at Laodicea, uh, when they were, when all the churches were getting together, trying to decide what books belonged in the Bible and which didn't, um, there's a thing that they call the Gospel of Thomas, but it's it doesn't belong in the Bible. And I think there's a book of Judas, too. They call it the Gospel of Judas. Yeah, I, I think. I'm not sure. That, that might be a uh, an urban legend or something. I don't know. But uh, they were trying to decide what books belonged in the Bible and which books didn't, because they had fake books back then. Well, guess what? The Laodiceans voted against the book of Revelation being in the Bible because <laughs> they didn't like it. Listen to this. I wonder why. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Ah, I just touched on this the other day. All right, let's go hit First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Yeah, there's people that think that uh, Benny Hinn and all those crowd, because God has blessed them with material things, that they're godly. That is what they believe. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. All right, let's go back to Revelation 3. You know, I couldn't imagine being um, a fantastically looking guy or with lots of money, um, having some of the most 
beautiful women in the world throwing themselves at you daily. Um, you know, well, example, Elvis Presley. Uh, I know Priscilla got highly upset with him because I'm, I guess she suspected he was cheating on her. Probably was, maybe was, I don't know. But uh, I just couldn't imagine those kind of temptations on a daily basis. Um, and let's face it, when a guy has a lot of money, there are women that will throw themselves at him. And the Bible warns against those kind of hurtful lusts. All right, verse 17, Revelation 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, spiritually speaking. Poor, blind, and naked, spiritually speaking. I count thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, well, Christ has the key to the door. But when he knocks, good idea to answer it, right? I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Matthew sixteen thirteen. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, if you read in uh, the book of Acts, it says that uh, that rock was Christ. I know the Vatican will love to teach you that Peter is the rock, but I'm sorry. I love Peter, and, but he's not the rock. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, we re, we've just read in Revelation that Jesus had the keys. And you can read about that in the first chapter of Revelation. And in verse 18 it says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys, the keys of hell and of death. Now, in 1 Kings 9.5, uh, I believe this is the Lord speaking to Solomon. 
Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. Now, Christ was of the line of David, and he is going to sit upon the throne of David. It's just, just that's, that's how it is. In Jeremiah 33, 17, For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of David. In other words, they'll never lack. He'll never have the lack. Uh, let's see. 1 Kings 2 and verse 45. And King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord for ever. Now, in Luke chapter 132. Now remember, uh, this is where Gabriel was talking to Mary. So let's take a look. You know, when he said that he was going to call her. Um, well, let's read it again. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. There you go. Now, in remember, uh, it's called the key of David, and it's ultimately fulfilled in Christ, but you know, the Old Testament is always a shadow of things to come for the New Testament to fulfill those things. But in Acts 13.22, we read, And when he had removed him, King Saul, he raised up unto him David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So, why was King David, why did God give him always to have a son on the throne? Why did he make David great? Why? Why was he a man after God's own heart? Well, let's take a look. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And verse 17, chapter 17 and verse 17, 1 Samuel 17, 17. Now, the background is Goliath is challenging Israel, and Israel's afraid, including King Saul. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. Now, David's older brothers were in the army, and, you know, army food is not much different than the food you had in school. So, uh, Jesse, their father, uh, took some parched corn and some bread, ten loaves, and uh, some cheese, and was going to give it to his sons so that they had something good to eat, so they'd be strong for, you know, the battles. Verse 18, And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how they, thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they, and all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, and left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench, as the host was going forth to the fight, and shouted for the battle. And Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. Now the Philistines were the tribe of the Canaanites. They were giants. 
Not all the Canaanites were giants, but the Philistines were indeed giants. They were at least nine foot tall. Verse 22. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with him, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. I'm not so sure how brave I'd be if some nine or ten foot man uh, came up to fight me those of you in Europe uh, that's three meters a guy three meters tall boy what a what a player for the NBA that would be huh that's the uh, basketball for those of you in Europe verse 25 and the men of Israel said have ye seen this man that has come up surely to defile you defy Israel is he come up and it shall be that the man who killeth him the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel so whoever kills Goliath um, the king of King Saul is going to give this guy a lot of money I guess give him his daughter for a wife and will make his father's house free in Israel. In other words, they not, they're not going to pay any taxes anymore. Sounds pretty good deal to me. Okay, you're going to make me rich. You're going to give me your daughter. I'm going to be a son-in-law to the king. And I'm not going to have to pay taxes? Such a deal. Oy vey. That's a joke. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this saying, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Now David had faith. He knew that God had given Israel the land. And he knew that these were the enemies of God. He knew that. He knew that they would be conquered, that they just had to have faith. And, of course, I hope you know the rest of the story where he took some stones from the smooth stones from the brook and, you know, used his shepherd's sling. And, you know, David had killed a lion and David had killed a bear. Killing a bear with a stone, with a sling, you know, I mean, a lion's a tough, tough bird to kill, but a, but a bear, boy, that's, that's something, huh? So I hope you know the rest of the story where David had faith that God wanted this Philistine dead. All right, let's skip down to verse 32. And David said to Saul, the king, okay, let no man's heart fail because of him, you know, the giant. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he be a man of war from his youth. Now everybody wants you to think that David was, you know, probably, you know, some 12-year-old. I don't think so. I think he was probably a late teenager, or uh, that's what I think. I think he was probably 18 or 19. And so, so he says, For thou art but a youth, and he be a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he hath defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. 
And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. See, Saul wanted nothing to do with this giant. <laughs> so, And, you know, he probably, probably in his mind, he's probably thinking, Hey, if this kid's crazy enough to do this, may the Lord be with him. You know, God loved, God loves this kind of faith. I mean, he loves this kind of faith. David knew that they were promised this land. He knew. And he acted on that promise. All right, so verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. I'm sure God's hand was on that stone, guiding it. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharam, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Wow. Now, there was another thing, too. Saul became jealous of David uh, because the people started praising David. And Saul got jealous and was concerned that, well, he knew he was leaving the Lord and the Lord was silent to him. So he was going to kill David to preserve his throne. So he started chasing after David. And there was a story where David came upon the king in a cave, I think it was in a cave, or in the field, I forget. But he could have killed Saul. He could have cut off his head, and that would have been the end of it. But David did not want to kill the the Lord's anointed because the Lord had picked Saul to be king and anointed him. And David said, I will not put my hand upon the Lord's anointed. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but... Uh, now, if you want to read about it, you can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 24, uh, verse 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. Now he was right there next to Saul, and he cut off a piece of his robe with his sword. I mean, he could have just as easily cut off his, his throat and separated his head from his body, but he didn't. Verse 5, And it came to pass that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anoint, anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And then David showed him the piece of the skirt, you know, and let him know, Hey, I could have killed you, but I didn't, you know. Why are you chasing after me? Why do you want to kill me? That was another thing that God loved about David. Now, if you really want to do some serious research, you can read the second book of Samuel, chapter 11. Uriah had a wife named Bathsheba. She was the mother of Solomon. And... She was bathing on the roof, and David could see her from the palace. And let me tell you something. You don't live next door to the king's palace unless you are somebody important. 
So Uriah must have been somebody important to, to you know, live next door to the king. And she's bathing on the roof, and David's checking her out. And you got to realize something. David's, David's got wives. He's got more than one. I mean, it's not like he's doing without. But he lusted after this woman, because I guess she was probably very beautiful. And um, the story goes that um, he got her pregnant. And then he tried to get Uriah to, he called him back from the battle, the war, and tried to have him go to his wife's house. But he wouldn't do that because he was an honorable man. You know, he's like basically saying, well, you know, everybody else is in the field um, in war. And, and what am I going to go to my house and sleep in a comfortable bed and have fun with my wife? So David was concerned that um, his sin would be found out. So what did he do? He sent a letter that he put in the hand of Uriah himself. And he told the captain of Uriah to um, take Uriah, put him at the, the, front, the battlefront, and then pull the army back so that he would be left you know, virtually alone and that would ensure his death. And then Bathsheba would be a widow, and then David could take her. You know, that was a very dishonorable thing. So let's read what the um, prophet Samuel has to say about this. I'm sorry, it wasn't Samuel, it was Nathan. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan the prophet. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come to him. In other words, this guy had all kinds of flock, but instead of taking a lamb from his flock, he, he took the poor man's only lamb and killed it and then prepared it. Verse 5, And David's anger was ki greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he hath done this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. It's you, David. Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah, and that if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And listen what David says. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned. Those are three words that the Lord wants to hear 
from our mouths. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So, this child died. Well then, Bathsheba got pregnant again and she had Solomon. And guess what? Like I've mentioned before, um, a lot of guys think, oh, having multiple wives, oh, what a fantasy that would be. It wasn't for David. His sons from different wives had killed each other. Matter of fact, one of his sons, Absalom, tried to kill David and would have done it. I mean, is that a fantasy? One of David's sons killed one of his other sons. And then one of his sons tried to kill him. That's why Nathan said that the sword, you know, it would be a, you know, a problem. He said, be, uh, verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And that's what happened. All right, let's go to the book of Revelation. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David. Now, why is he called the root of David? Because Christ created the heavens and the earth. He created Adam, you know, and if you trace back David far enough, you'll eventually come to Adam. So, Christ is actually called the root and the offspring of David. So weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Do you know the prayers of saints are golden vials full of odors? Hmm. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, 
Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22 and we'll close this up. Revelation 22 and verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Twelve fruits, twelve tribes of Israel, right? Twelve apostles. Verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and the, his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. I think I'd rather have the name of the Lord in my forehead rather than the mark of the beast. What do you think? Verse 5. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto him his servants the things which must, which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Huh. There's people tell you that if you do these things, you're a, a lordship salvationist. That you're earning your salvation by keeping God's commandments. But Jesus said, Blessed are, well, blessed are they that do his commandments. Well, the angel said this, I think, or John. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent, uh, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of I am the root and the offspring of David. There you go. Jesus was the creator of David and his son. And when you can figure that out, <laughs> you know a lot. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. In the NIV Bible, I believe it's in Isaiah 14. In the NIV Bible, they take the word Lucifer out of the Bible 
and insert a name for Christ, the morning star, in his place, thus essentially turning Christ into Lucifer. And you wonder why I tell people, stick with the King James Bible. Everybody knows who Lucifer is. Luciferians know who Lucifer is. Satanists know who Lucifer is. But you're going to tell me the translators of the NIV Bible doesn't know who Lucifer is and they got to put Morning Star in its place? Wow. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And I'm sorry, in the NIV, Christ is not the one. The morning Christ the morning star. Oh, and the, the complete Jewish Bible does the same thing. They delete Lucifer and insert morning star, who they say is Yeshua. So in Isaiah 14, Yeshua the morning star fell from heaven and is going down to the pit of hell. Yeah. And you wonder why I don't like the word Yeshua. I like the word Joshua. It's the sixth book of the Bible in the Old Testament. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of the book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. The NIV people pay attention. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. He which testify this thing saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that, everybody, is the king, the key of David. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In his precious name, amen.